Hey everybody, it's Mark Pattis in the back again with another great episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. Before we get to today's wonderful guest, I do want to remind everybody to go to my website, www.markpattisonnfl.com. I've got another climb coming up in September, which you can check out, headed to France, headed to Switzerland for for, uh, Mount Blanc and the Matterhorn. So that's number one, number two. Um, also on my website, you can find the uh, amazing Emmy winning best picture searching for the summit. The NFL uh, did on my uh, expedition to Mount Everest last year. It's pretty epic. Um, and so go in, check that out. And then uh, also we've got over 250 podcasts now, which is a heck of a lot of podcasts. Uh, appreciate the love. If you went to Apple to give a ratings and review helps elevate the popularity of the show. So we can help inspire others. And always, I continue to raise money for Amelia's Everest, my vehicles through higher ground here in Sun Valley, Los Angeles, and New York. It's all about trying to empower others. And that's what life is all about. So on that note, let me jump into today's rock star guest. His <laughs> name is Terry Ahoya. <laughs> I don't think I said it's a whole lot. Yeah. How you doing, Terry? I'm doing great. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. No, hey, I appreciate it. So let's back up. Um, so I met you uh two years ago now i had just come off mount everest and i descended of all places i went from the highest peak in the (laughs) world to the lowest point on earth in greenville mississippi and and i know that you've been a part of steve azar's um wonderful golf uh, delta blues tournament for the last several years, you've been a big supporter of his, which is awesome. But the reason why you were there and the reason why I was there is because Steve likes to pull in different people, have done notable things. In your case, you were on the US ski team many years ago. And you know, you had your your time just like I had my time in the NFL. And I want to know what that was like. Um, you know, skiing so many years ago, and we all transitioned through life. I know you're not involved in the ski industry anymore but at least you get to kind of relive your glory to some level at these golf tournaments that both you and I were at. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Well, Steve and I have known each other for about 20 years. We met at uh, Gino Toretta's event down in Miami and we all do events. You know, I have an event. I've had an event in Marquette, Michigan with Steve Mariucci and Tom, the three of us co-host it. And Steve came to that one. But so we've, we've, uh, we've just been doing events and see each other all the time. And, we're, and I was actually on his tour when it was Bob Seeger. I helped to get that going with, uh, with management. So anyways, um, uh, that's, that's where we met was with, at Steve's. So, you know, I, I guess we're talking about beginning of my career. Yeah, I mean, let's go back and 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 so you're a guy who grew up in Michigan, and you know when I I've, I've played in Michigan before, um, I, I uh, back in the day I was I was fortunate to play against Michigan there, and and we won and we beat them, nice. um, but as I as I as I look out through the the landscape of the great state of Michigan and the Upper Peninsula and all these different places which I've been to, I don't, I'm not seeing a whole lot of mountains. There might be you know <laughs> elevated bluffs or whatever you want to call those, but not a whole lot of mountains, but, but the fact is that's where you grew up and, and you're a guy that would ultimately make the U S Olympic team. You were on there for three years, 82 to 84, you got injured and then you skied beyond that. But, but, you know, how does somebody from a, a, an area like Michigan, like I grew up in the state of Washington yeah. and there's all kinds of mountains up there. I'm currently living in Sun Valley. We got the most amazing mountain. You've been here sure. you ski Sun Valley. Um, how does the guy from Michigan make it all the way to the Olympics? You know, or the Olympic I, team. Backtrack for a bit. I, yeah. I didn't make the Olympics. I, I got hurt before a Sarajevo. I was third number, ranked third in Slalom, so I was going, but yeah. behind Phil and Steve Mayor. And so, but anyways, a, a couple of parallels between Steve and I is uh, I always w- I wondered where his music came from, and when he visited my hometown. And I showed him this little bump that I grew up on a rope toe skiing. He couldn't believe but that I did what I did. And then when I went to Delta Soul, I got him. I figured out his how he writes because where he's from, the soulfulness of of the you know Mississippi Delta. And so, anyway, no, 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 Terry. Just to clarify, you're talking about Steve Azar right oh, now, yeah. correct? Sure. Yes, I am. Because, because you bled in Steve Mayer and Phil Mayer, which, by the way, they're from this great state of Washington, right? Yep. And yes, they grew yeah. up in a, in, a, in, a, in a little teeny tiny ski resort called White yeah. Bass. Yeah, Yakima is the town they're from. That's right. right. That's and, right. And, and a side bit, um, Cooper Cup's dad played with Phil in high school football. 
So Cooper Cut's killing it right now. I know. In, in the NFL the Rams. I emailed Phil and I said, did you play with his dad? He goes, hell yeah, we're good friends. Yeah, Anyways, yeah, cool. So uh, back to my beginning of my skiing, I guess my mother started me as a, a young young skier, probably three. And and I grew up on a little little small hill that not even grew up on. It was a park and, they, and it, people were sledding. And my dad took some of his old shoes, cut the... Uh, toes off and put them on the skis and that's what i had for skis <laughs> that's awesome only totally would have done a spiral fracture if i fell but i couldn't fall because that would have hurt but anyway so from there uh i, I moved to you know uh, cliffs ridge marquette mountain which is uh in marquette and then iron mountain pine mountain two very small probably uh uh what are they probably 300 vertical feet maybe i don't I, you know so when you say when you say marquette you're now talking about wisconsin Marquette, the UP, Upper Peninsula. The U, okay, UP. That's, okay, got it. that's Northern Michigan. That's where Mooch played football as a quarterback. And uh, yeah. Tom Izzo, his best friend as a child, played uh, basketball there. So Marquette is kind of the Northern Michigan is, is the college. Uh, but so I, I advanced at every level. Uh, and I think the first race my mother took me to was a place called Indian Head Mountain. And I'd been on this little hill at Gladstone, where I'm from, uh, you know, up till then and this is my first race and it's an organized race called uh you know ussa and uh, i got to indian mountain and I, this course had like three three different head walls and i went i can't i can't do this <laughs> and i probably fell 10 times i don't i don't remember exactly how many times but every one of those uh experiences as i kept going uh were, were a new experience for me because i'm from a middle class family and uh you know i ended up uh having some success at 16 and made the junior nationals and was on my first airplane ride going to the junior nationals in squaw valley and so i think that a lot of my drive came from all these new experiences that i wouldn't have if i wasn't an athlete and so you know wouldn't would have the opportunity to experience and so uh when i got for <laughs> i'll go back to squaw valley so they made the junior national at 16 get to squaw valley i see all these kids i've been reading about you know, in ski racing magazine, all this stuff. And I'm going, I can't do this. No way. Not possible. And, and, uh, I guess, you know, if eventually that kind of went away, even, even though, uh, it was still a doubt in my mind, cause I'm from a small mountain, like I said, and then I, so I moved to Vail in 19, uh, let's see in, in 80, uh, when I was 18, joined ski club Vail, which is where a lot of kids are outcome. That's where Lindsey Vaughn came out of, uh, you know, so, and Lindsey Vaughn started in Buck Hill, Minnesota, with a coach I know, um, Eric Seiler. So she came from a tiny little hill, then became one of the world's best downhillers, you know? So uh, anyway, so it got to Vail and that was another new experience, living in a town on my own and trying to make, you know, uh, you know and I was a member of Ski Club Vail and uh, I started uh, winning races. And, and, one, and it was my second year at Ski Club Vail, I won 10 slums in a row. Uh, on the circuit, uh, uh, there was a um, uh, Eldoro Cup, and so I, I was beating nationally ranked kids all, all the time. And, and how did you just that? How did you support yourself? Excellent. You know, it, it, so there's kind of two questions laced in here. Number one is, uh, you know, I've been skiing for all my life, okay, mm -hmm. and obviously my 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 main path that I went on was was football from college to the NFL, obviously started in high school. And, and, but I do know that in between during the winter, when I wasn't playing football, I'd be up skiing and it could always create a very much of a party atmosphere. Right. And that's just yeah. kind of the culture of, of skiing. And so there are two, there's two questions. One, how did you support yourself? That's one. And two is, is how did you stay focused on the end game, which is to go to the Olympics while putting yourself in a culture that it's good times, you know, on the mountain, drinking beers and all that stuff Well, at, eight, at 18 years old. Yeah, I guess it's interesting because our family had a concrete business, ready mix concrete. So that's a summer business. It's not so good in the winter in Michigan. So my dad pretty much put me through every construction uh, experience there was. I worked in an asphalt crew for one summer. And I, I remember because this is how focused I was uh, between asphalt coming to the tr to the truck, and, and I was a loop man. They call it, you know, and you're moving on, on the highway. I'd go down in the ditch and do sit-ups 
And these, these guys, I'm a part of the crew, you know, said, what's going on? Are you crazy? I said, yeah, I'm a skier. I'm, it's what I do. So I read, that's how I, I made some money to support what I was doing. My parents didn't have a lot of money. So it was not, and skiing's not a very uh, easy sport to get into with no money. That's for sure. Yeah. But, but I guess I worked almost every summer uh, in some phase of construction to support what I was going to do in the winter. Uh, it, aside from that, I, I went to Mount Hood probably 10 years in a row for a month of summer. And so I, then I go back to work, but Mount Hood is where the glaciers are. That's where everybody trains. And so, so all those, so just that for all the people that don't know, Mount Hood is in Oregon. And like you said, it's a mountain, big old glacier. glacier. And there's yeah. actually a, uh, uh, there's a chair that goes up and down and yep. people go there to train. That's where all the teams go now. Back in the day, there was just a few, but uh, I guess so. So supporting myself is how I did that. What was the second part of it? Yeah, I just had, yeah. And, and, and the second part was just, you know, how did you stay focused on the oh, end yeah. goal of going to Olympics while being in a party atmosphere? Well, that's interesting because I was uber focused. So uh, even living in Vail, Colorado, which is a tough town to live in, like just like you said, uh, not unlike Sun Valley. And so um, uh, I just, I, I, I was going to, I was win, been winning all these races and I still did not get the notice from the US ski team. They, you know, I beat all their kids, all the junior nationals. I beat everybody for a whole year straight. And I was about, I went home to Michigan in the summer and uh, told my dad I'm going to turn professional because there was good money out there. ABC had the tour then, Bob Beatty. Who, yeah. who put the tour together and it was on that's why i ski race because i saw uh joseph odermatt racing when i was 12 years old on abc or, or whoever it was you know uh that's what really you know and i taught told bobby Addy this many times before he passed i said beats you're the guy you're the reason i was a ski racer man because you had abc television wild river sports and that was the the thing that drove me so uh i i got after that that year, my second year in vale beating everybody, I got, I got kind of bummed out about it because I'm, what I got to do? I got, I just beat everybody all year. And so uh, I told my father I was going to turn pro. There was a bunch of money out there for me. Uh, Rosino was offering a bunch of money with Solomon and, you know, different sponsors. And so they said, now let's, let's make one effort to see if we can get you to, uh, to a ski team camp. And so my dad called the ski team or wrote him a letter and said, you guys are, this is terrible. So they, they invited me. And I remember it very well. So I flew into uh, uh, Portland because I was, I was training at, um, sun, up at Mount Hood. And uh, the, all these kids from the East, you know, and I'm, I showed up like in a dress shirt and suit or something. Because like, I, we, I didn't know. I mean, so we get to the mountain and uh, I beat everybody by two seconds in time trials. All, the, whole, the whole week I was there. So they had to take me. <laughs> they had to take me to Europe, you know. And I remember coach was named uh, Conrad Rickenbach. And I came down and, and I had reps telling me I was winning by two seconds, like from Dina Star, the guys that, that I knew forever I said, man, you're kicking everybody's butt. And uh, it's awesome because they're all behind me. And so uh, Conrad just looked at me when I came down on one of my runs and said, guess I got to take it to Europe. <laughs> and it was a smirk on his mouth, you know, and uh, and then I went down to the dry line training. You'll appreciate this because as a football player, I did two days as a high school player, you know, so. Uh, we had to have certain criteria, uh, run the mile in a certain amount of time, uh, you know, different parts of, you know, physical fitness. And I remember I did the mile and I went behind the bleachers and threw up. <laughs> and all these kids from the East, right? They're going, he's just throwing up. And I came back, said, what's next? That's what we do, right? Yeah. <laughs> Two days. And awesome. so that also was part of, you know, pr pr probably one of the reasons they wanted to take me. And so once I got there to, to, to the team, I guess, uh, one thing that really inspired me was Phil and Steve Mayer, uh, wow. watching them work, what they did. Uh, Steve, Phil was the first guy at breakfast at six in the morning with his ski boots on. I mean, now we're not skiing for a couple hours yet, but he's got his boots on. He's ready to go. We're going up on the glacier in Italy or somewhere wherever we were. And uh, so, so I guess more than anything, those two really made me see the see what's what's out there and how to work at it and be straight about you know not partying, getting rest, and all that stuff. So I guess. They they were an impact, and um, I guess you know from there on you just you just try to you have to stay focused because you're going you're doing a sport that you're going very fast, and mm -hmm. so there's not a lot of room for partying, especially when training camp, you know. And so uh, I'm sure you agree with that from the NFL standpoint. You know, it's 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 serious business when you're in there. Uh, you get injured very easily in football as well as skiing. So. 
So that was it. Yeah. So, so I think when you are in the sport of racing on skis, it's not if it's when you're going to crash. Okay. (laughs) And that's just the way it is. And you're crashing at very high rates of speed. Um, In 1984, after being on the Olympic team and, and uh, I I I wasn't on on the team though. No, I I know that. Yeah. I've said it. I raced in Sierra Hill the year before in 83. So yeah, I raced. Yeah. So, so the U S ski team, but that leads then to the Olympics, you know, ultimately, but you're on the U S ski team and that's your goal um, to go. And, and now you suffer, a pretty tough injury and now you got to battle back and you know once people go through that we've seen this with lindsey vaughn we've seen this with many other people where you know they get blown out their their knees they're all over it's you know the classic wild wide world of sports sure. you mentioned this before but when they're talking about the thrill of victory to the agony of defeat and the guy flips off you know the, sure. the jump and crashes and you know it, it's hardcore right yeah. and and so for you what was that like how devastating was that and then what was the road back well so so backtracking i was going to talk about this uh i was in the zone twice in my career as a skier and and the zone meaning everything was in slow motion one the first time was at mount hood when i beat all those kids in all those trials i was yeah. de- i didn't think i was going that fast that's that's how you that's what i experienced as a zone uh so then we went to europe for you know the next year or that season and uh, I was so on my game. I started like a hundred in, in a race, a rope club race, you know, maybe 99. I can't remember what starting order way back. And I came down and I was top five both days. I, and I thought for sure I was going slow. And from there on, I was skiing every, every race. It felt like it was a slow motion for a month or so. And we flew from uh, Zurich. This is interesting because you're from Seattle, right? We flew from Zurich to Seattle and we parked our, our, our buses, our vans outside of our hotel. Uh, we were going to the U.S. Nationals at Mission Ridge. When at, uh, is it Wenatchee? Wenatchee, yeah, Wenatchee. Yeah. 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 And, and so all of our stuff got ripped off. <laughs> Everything was gone from our vans at the Red Roof in, in Seattle Airport. <laughs> you know, so we ended up you know, getting new stuff or whatever, and we went to, uh, uh, up to uh, Wenatchee. And at that time, Mark, I, I, I knew I couldn't be beaten song. I, I, I was in the zone still, and it was happening. And the first run, the Net U.S. National, I won. I was in first place. And the second run, I'm, I'm not going to lose. I know that. I feel that good about it. And uh, I got my ski kind of just caught, not caught even, just I think that, in fact, I was skiing so well. This is crazy to say, but I was skiing so well at the time. I overpowered my knee because my 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 quad and my you know hamstrings we just it just tore up my it blew out my acl in mid-turn i did not crash nothing i heard so i see i can see that all the time now in the nfl when a guy does a little tweak to his knee and they try to come off to go it's okay yeah. like, that's torn acl because yeah. it happened i you yeah. know and so so that happened I, I i blew it up and i and i thought to myself man i think I don't think it's that bad, you know? And so we drove, we went from Seattle or from um, uh, Wenatchee down to Tahoe and it was a big 10 foot storm, snowstorm and I couldn't get from Squaw Valley to Lake Tahoe to have my knee operated by Dr. Stebbin or even looked at. And I still kept thinking it was good because I had like a week before I was able to even get to the doctor. But uh, anyways, I, I had surgery and it was an ACL and it, it was, it's tough to take, man, when you've been working your ass off to, to get where I got, you know, and here it is. And uh, the only the only good thing that came out of it is probably that uh, I wouldn't have married my wife if I would have went to the Olympics in '84. <laughs> for sure. Fact, you know. So and I've been married 37 years, so you met her. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so so anyways, uh, rehab starts, and I was working my butt just like I always did to try to get it. And and uh, they put us back on skis in six months, unlike NFL or anywhere. You know, I had. I had an operation in March and I was skiing in September in Austria. And so that's pretty early, but I still was pretty gingerly about it, you know, and I was still ranked third. And, and so I was, you know, the Olympics were coming up and I didn't, I couldn't go. And so that's what happened. And so I, after 84, I turned professional and took that money, <laughs> got a nice fat contract with a couple of ski companies and bought a new car. And started traveling on the circuit and it was still had great tv deal with uh abc you know the the tour did 
and uh, it was still it was enterprising. I, I made a lot of money professionally, and I made a lot of money from sponsors. So I made I made a living out of it, you know. And, and it was a uh, uh, it was a great experience. Travel all over the country. Before that, all over the world. In fact, I, I went. I started uh, modeling clothes in Tokyo and Japan, part of ski wear and uh, uh, sportswear. And so that that's what I guess back to where you asked me about how I get where the drive came from. Everywhere I went in my sport, I got a new experience, and I was really appreciative of it. You know. Yeah. No, that's great. So recently in Sun Valley, they debuted a film. Uh, with Spider Savage, and oh, I'm wondering, I'm wondering, and I, I have no clue about his story. You know, the guy was a rock star for a certain yeah, period of time, yeah. and at the end, he had. I wanted to be him. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of people did. You know, yeah, he looked great. Yeah. He was yeah, coming yeah. down, he was charismatic, yeah. and then he, yeah. then he, he gets together with this wacko chick, and she ends up shooting him and killing Acting. him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was just, it was, it was amazing. But were, were you skiing about the same time that? No, he was no, I'm younger than him. So he was one of the guys I would see on TV that would inspire me, which I told Bob Beatty. I said, "Beast, yeah, but I want to be Spider Man for sure." He's, he's yeah. on. K2. I remember him because he was on K2s, which I thought was really cool. Yeah. You know, I mean, I didn't think there'd be any chance I would do that, but that's what I wanted to do, and it, I was inspired by guys like Spider and, uh, like I said. Um, Joseph Odermatt, different names from the past on TV, but yeah, he was he was a super cool guy, and I, I didn't know him. Mark, Mark Tache knew him well because Mark's from Aspen, Kristen Cooper's husband, and my who's a friend of mine. I forgot to say that, but uh, he was an Aspen guy, and and man, it really was. I guess it was some kind of gut, gut shot to the tour when that happened, you know, because he was a, he was a star. So I want to talk to you about you know we did. The name of the show is Finding Your Summit, People Overcoming Adversity and Finding Their Way. And we've just kind of documented, you know, you're you're on this great path. Um, you blow at your knee and then and then ultimately you make it back and you're in the pro circuit. You were able to support yourself for a number of years and that all went well. But at some point in time, you know, we all transition out of the sports that you just physically, you know, we get older and bones get more creaky and and the recovery time is longer and everything else. And so um, my my question to you is how difficult was that transition coming out of the ski industry into what's next? Um, yeah, I, I think that I, I you know being in business, a family business, my whole life with my parents, and you know running a concrete business, and my dad, you know, I, I basically started running it at 25 years old, so I had a lot of experience for a business to do something past skiing, you know. Uh, um, but but I, I will say that um, I know how I remembered. I, I do remember how I ended up uh, ending my career. Um, I was at uh, Bachelor Mountain in uh, Bend, Oregon. Mm -hmm. Road pro race. I have it on. It's I have it on film. It's TV. ESPN was covering the race, and I caught my tip going off one of the bumps. They're in pro ski racing, they have two mad main bumps, and I caught my tip and got spun around and hit my head and knocked myself out. And mm -hmm. I, that was that was a that was the scariest thing that ever happened to me. You know, I was all I thought about was my new son that I had, and my wife. And I'm in Oregon, and they're back in Michigan. And I I, I don't know what I was thinking because I mean, I'm sure you had concussions in your career. Uh, it's it's a tough it's a tough injury. You know, it's like you start thinking weird. And uh, I, I that was pretty much what ended it. And when I flew home after that injury, I, and I and it was looked at in Green Bay because that's where I, I'm near. 100 miles from Green Bay, and there was a neurologist I knew there. It was involved with the Packers, and so uh, I was okay, but I had concussion, um, post-concussion syndrome, and I, I went to a couple more races after that. Qualified, got made the money to qualify, but I just pulled out. So I, I don't want to do this anymore. And uh, the the biggest factor, other biggest factor, was my son. When you're traveling a lot on the road, we were gone four weeks sometimes at a time. I was gone. Yeah, sometimes my wife and the kid would go, son would go, but lots of time they wouldn't. And when I came home one time uh, after a four or five week trip, uh, my little guy was in a snowsuit walking down the street and I, and I went, hey, buddy, Nick, how are you doing? And he didn't know who I was. He was scared. And that's when it, that's when it hit me. I said, you know what? I got to end this stuff right now because I'm, I don't want to get hurt anymore. And I don't want to risk not being there for him. And so that that was a big factor, and I, I don't know if I backtrack too much on that for a mark, but that's that was vital to me. Yeah, I mean it's key. It's just the the transition, and it sounds like you had the awakening, you know, from that concussion. Yeah. On it is time to move on, and yeah. and so speaking of moving on, I know you've you've been uh, you've had your hands in some some different things. 
um, like you said, you grew up, you know, with kind of a business background from your, your from your family, from your dad and mom. Um, what are you doing today? Because you've you've you used to live in in the uh, in Michigan and the Upper Peninsula, and now I think you're you you find yourself in Florida, that which is again about the flattest place on earth you could be. <laughs> yeah, and I, I love this. I love the warm weather. I'd rather be hot than cold. But I, I we still have a home in Michigan. My plan was to get back there, you know, three months in the summer, but I've been so busy as a builder and design builder. Uh, I, I haven't gotten back as much. I still go back uh, a few weekends, you know, in July and August, and my wife will be going back. We go back for a wedding, but we have a great house on Lake Michigan. And, mm. and so uh, I, I would say, but I am a Florida boy now for sure. Uh, and, and I, so, you know, um, I, I just, I, I, I don't have a desire to be in snow anymore. And I guess, cause my feet are so shot from my ski boots and my, you know, frostbite at one time or another. And uh, I like to be comfortable. My body it works a lot better in the heat. I'm sure you yeah. feel that when you're going from Sun Valley to somewhere warm. Uh, yeah, and, it, it, there's no question about it. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. And so, you, you know, typically you see a lot of people moving down from New York to, to, uh, to Florida. Um, and a lot of people on the West Coast moving to California or Palm Springs or something like that. So there, there's a reason behind that. Sure. And that's why I'm here, because there's a lot of development going on. There's so much work. I mean, I, I've, I've worked every day straight for four years, pretty much. You know, yeah. so uh, I'm just doing it right now to, you know, we had several businesses in, in Michigan and we sold our hotel. Uh, we had a hotel that uh, we owned for about 20 years. I built that. So I was a developer too, but during the skiing career, I was, my father was an engineer and we did a lot of uh, development together, we built buildings, owned buildings, sold them, you know, condominiums. Uh, anyways, we, I built a hotel, uh, my wife and I owned it for 20 years and in a 10th year of ownership, she wanted to build a spa salon. So I built that inside the hotel and that was successful. So we, when we came down to uh, Florida, it was kind of like, uh, let's design build not have payroll anymore, have subcontractors, as opposed to Friday signing checks for everybody. Cause I met a yep. payroll for 30 years, every Friday of the year. And I never wrote myself a check, but yeah, it signed everybody else's paychecks, you know? So, and I'm not complaining about it. it was, it's fine. But eventually I just wanted to have an easier business where I'm just having subcontractors. They take care of their own workman's comp, their own, you know, everything. So uh, payroll tax, all that stuff. And so, um, uh, that's the part of why we're here more often than we are in Michigan. It's a little tougher to do that in Michigan. So. Yeah, no, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you're, you're, you're involved in charities from the standpoint of, like I said, I just, we just connected recently yep. in Mississippi and what has been kind of your drive? Is it, I know we all want to help everybody else, but is it, is it also, I mean, I would imagine a big reason, um, that, you know, whether it's, uh, Mooch's, uh, 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 charities that he has going on in Michigan where he comes together to try to raise money to help others or Steve Azar's down in Mississippi. How much of that stuff do you do per year? Uh, I mean, you could do an event a month if you wanted to, you know, mainly golf, obviously a skiing. I, I did the American Ski Classic in Vail for probably 16 years and I'm from Vail. So uh, I was one of the legends of skiing and, and it was a great experience. And so all these events, and I'm sure you know this, Mark, you meet other people, other athletes, maybe other uh, musicians that have a lot, you have a lot in common. I mean, um, I know John Daly really likes to play his event. And John, I, I've been able to connect John with Steve, John with other people, Steve with other people. That, that's kind of the thing. It's about the people as much as it is about fundraising because that's how you make make good fundraisers as good people. Uh, and, and so, for instance, Steve Mariucci is one of the most compelling speakers I've ever been around. Uh, you know, yeah. when, he, when he comes home for this thing where he's from and he gets in, it, it's, uh, it's called the Beacon House and it's for, it's next to the hospital, Marquette General, which is a brand new hospital. And it's a house where folks can stay if they have a, a family member being sick for a long time or, or something like, even for surgery. And he raised money, man, and and he's just like a football coach doing it. You know, he's he's really inspiring, and so uh, that's part of why, you know, these events are so great. There's just great people, you know. So I, I could do, I, I try to I try to limit them to four or five a year now. So and I don't do skiing anymore, so that's good because that's a little bit hairier. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're, you're actually going on skis, and you know, I've gotten hurt at those pro ams before. 
but yeah, I think it's about the people, Mark, more than anything. I, I'm sure you feel the same way. It's, you meet folks like you and I met, and yep. you know, um, you have a lot to experience uh, that I, like, the same experiences, I guess. You know, uh, one of the first events that I did a long time ago was Gino Toretta's in Miami, and that's where I met Steve. And Gino uh, ha- knew everybody, you know, and so. Uh, his event had a lot of people that had their own events. So I guess that's how kind of I, I branched out a lot. Uh, Jim McMahon was always there and Jim and I became really close friends. And uh, Jim is a great guy for charity. He'd do anything for the troops. And so you meet interesting people, you know, and so I met Jim and his son was going to, going to come to college at FGCU, Florida Gulf Coast University, where my son was going for on a golf scholarship. Well, Jim's son was a baseball pitcher. So I said, Jim, if um, Zach wants to live with Nick, I have a house down there. He can live there. So, you know, Nick's, Jim's son lived with Nick for a year in college. That's because of the program that I met Jim at a long time ago. We're friend, very good friends to this day. I mean, he, came yeah. to Mar- he came to my event at, at uh, uh, Marquette with Mooch's event. He said, uh, the only reason I'm going to this event is because of you, Mooch and your sorry ass. <laughs> yeah, ha, ha, ha. yeah I, I got an opportunity there too. Well, I played against him back in the day. Jim uh, McMahon, yeah. and I got an opportunity to meet him with Morton Anderson this last year at the Super Bowl. And uh, and he's gone through some health issues. And of course, I know Steve Mirucci through Jim Mora. And I had a really fun night with them many years ago down at, at Jim's uh, event in Atlanta when Jim used to be the head coach of the Falcons. But sure. back to your point, I think, you know, the world of networking, the world of coming together um, to to do something greater um, is just a wonderful thing. And, you know, back to your your point, that's how you and I met, right, yeah. two years ago. Yeah. And then we finally got around to doing this thing. Sure. But, sure. Um, you know, listen, nothing but success to you. Uh, you're living your best life right now. I can tell your positive influence, your positive energy when I've been around you. Um, that's been wonderful. And, and uh, you know, I totally appreciate you coming on the pod. You bet. You bet. Uh, uh, I like reading about your your new ventures that what you're doing. Uh, I, one thing I wanted to mention: Phil and Steve Mayer's father yeah. was the oldest man to summit ever set one year back in maybe 20 years ago. Did you? Yeah. Did you were you aware of that? I, I didn't know. No. How old was he? I don't know. I can't remember because Phil and Steve are my age, or a little older than me. So he must have been. Uh, I don't know what would be. I I, I should have googled it. I didn't before the. Uh, yeah, I know. We'll figure that out later. I did. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you this. I, I did. Uh, uh, I was on the climbing expedition party with a guy named Art Muir, who's been on the pod. He was seventy-five years old. He's the oldest American to ever um, have have climbed uh, Mount Everest. And you know, I turned. I was fifty-nine last year. I turned sixty this year. And it's no picnic to go up. You just don't recover like you used to. And so. Right. Um, you know, good for art for 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 doing that, getting that accomplishment. And yeah. you know, I feel very blessed and fortunate to have actually made it to the top oh, man. back down in one piece. So that's that's <laughs> I can appreciate it. I really can. I, I admire it. So yeah, no. Okay, everybody, there he is, the one, the only Terry Ahola. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you. Okay. Cool. That's a wrap. <laughs> was it good <laughs> I don't know yeah